opens up a lot of issues beyond just that about what we do with with uh, energy and industry and power now. Um, so, so I don't know. Does anybody else want to build on that? Yes, sir. I think that was an interesting adaptation there, Clay. But I also think uh, that the message that Orwell had in the book about the windmill was poignant. In that, I mean, obviously, in, uh, in a literal sense, it was about the five-year plan and about. Soviet Russia, the entire book was a metaphor for Soviet Russia. Uh, but in a broader sense, I think that the windmill represented the ideal, the ideal that was supposed to be, that they were striving for. And so if we put that in the lens of Occupy, maybe the windmill, the complete reform, is what Occupy is striving for. And so I think in that light, it's important to be pragmatic, because the windmill ultimately was what tore that leadership apart. And so as a movement, I think Occupy needs to consider and be pragmatic and realize that all of its goals aren't going to be met overnight and that maybe that ideal isn't something that's um, immediately attained. Um, I just wanted to go on that because um, you were talking about how like, the windmill was like what you know, it was said to look like. You know, it was kind of like the culmination of the rebellion. Um, and I think that's really interesting because I think maybe it was you, Linda, or um, Sarah and Michael that we were talking about, we were talking about how, you know, it's a revolution, you know, of all kinds, it's all encompassing, it's about ourselves, it's about our relationships, about everything. We don't know, though, what it's going to look like in the end. We just know it's going to be different, it's going to be better, we're going to be healthier, but we don't know what we're going to be doing. You know, we don't know where we're going to be because it's that big and it's that all over. And, um, oh yeah, and also um, when Snowball and what's the other one? Napoleon were arguing, I thought it was interesting that the one said something about our goals and Napoleon was like, well, what are they? Because that's, that's um, the demand that we get a lot from the media and from, you know, my parents and like, you know, <laughs> like, what is all this about, you know, like, you're making a lot of noise, you're up to bat, like, we see you, but what is it, and like, I think that demand is a lot more difficult to reach, like, one windmill isn't going to satisfy, you know, the hunger, you know, they need more, and I think it's really interesting, because that's something I know, like, my thing is science, I sit and I paint science, and I'm always, like, put with, well, what is broad enough to get it? You know, it's very important that you have your direct point and get it across so that's clear and unquestionable. And it's so difficult. Like I said, like I'm faced with that question all the time. Like, well, what do you guys really want? It's like, well, we want it all, you know? <laughs> but, and, and people say that we're demanding too much. But it's like, this is what <coughs> is said to be ours. And we say it all the time. We go rah rah, and you know I love America on the Fourth of July, but what the hell are we doing besides keg stands? Like we don't know what we're celebrating. And man, I'm really going off here. I'm sorry, but no, it's <laughs> I, I really like it that that's the like you put on the whole windmill thing because we don't know what it's going to look like. We just know it's got to be different. Well, and, and we should. Uh... I'd love to commiserate with you sometime about science because uh, for some verse of theater, I make a lot of the posters. It's like, well, I want to convey this, but what right, the hell's going to say it to people, et cetera, et cetera. I really should have done advertising, but it's like, <laughs> it's a corporate evil of a <laughs> <laughs> um, But I mean, that point is actually one that I think is very interesting is, uh, you know, what does the movement really stand for? And all I hear from the right wing is saying, well, they don't have an uh, articulated agenda, and that means they must, they must be And that's hopeless. easier to put down, too, is like, if we say these are our goals, it's easier to like, oh, Right, yeah, they want to come out and say something specific so they can have something to piss on. But, um, I but I... goals are something that has never happened before, so... It's also, impossible. yeah, right. It goes to the condition. We're conditioned to want, like, known outcomes. Well, you do this and you get that, but doing this, you have no idea what you're going to get. And I think that you know one of the things we have to break is this idea that we know exactly what's going to happen. We can set goals because the goal is a world that has never existed. So how do you answer the question right. of making something that's never happened? And I think to get into that conversation, you're referring to a knowledge of the past, to articulate things in a way that they've been in the past. We're, be we're becoming co-creators and collaborators in a universal experiment. When has that ever happened? When has the whole world been in 
involved in a conversation about change and what comes of that. And the Bible, when there's only five people. Yeah. <laughs> five people and don't forget a donkey. <laughs> I think we're I think we're at a historic moment. You know, I said this today in this congregation at the church you know, that we spoke at, and um, I think we're at a historic moment. Not not just because it's another movement. Like movements are historic. You know, they come maybe once a generation, right? And that's obviously you know this is a movement, right? But I think the intentions behind this movement are very significantly and historically different than any other movement really that I've ever studied in history. Because again, number one. It's a world conversation. That has never happened, ever, in history. There's never been a conversation about a world revolution. There has been thoughts about it. There has been some attempts at it. But it's never really taken hold. And uh, you know, this is the first movement in our generation that has some possibility. You know, it's still way too early to say oh, we're successful and it's going to happen. I mean, I think we're way too early for that. But you know, I think any real movement that's going to be historically recognized for transformation and change is going to be years in the making. We're months, we're weeks in the making. Weeks. So I think, I think you know, we all need to catch our breath and realize who's in the room and realize that you know the people you may be scratching and fighting with, you know, are really the people that are you're in solidarity with, you know, and that and that there's a there's there's bigger there's a bigger conversation to have. And you know, I hope in the months and weeks ahead that we continue to regionally, northeastern, nationally, and internationally organize uh, at different tiers and different levels to just continue this conversation in a bigger way. Well, um, so I guess I'll be the jerk and say, uh, I think there, we need them. There, 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 there have been a lot of world revolutionary movements. Um, this is this is not. I mean, yes, you, there's a unique and wonderful energy to the Occupy movement, which I think is fantastic. But don't feel it's alone in world history. Uh, there are many examples that I encourage everybody to be looking at in terms of 68, when revolutions were bursting out in almost every country in the world, east and west. In terms of 1919, you know, very much the inspiration of the issues that this play is talking about, when revolution was bursting out all over the world, where they where they organized the first uh, the first communist international to organize revolutionary parties in every in every country in the world. You look back to 1848 when there were revolutionary revolutions bursting out in every country that was mostly in Europe, but spread in North America, Asia. Um, so uh, yes, there's something very unique and beautiful about the Occupy movement. I totally agree. But I don't think we have to say, "Gee, we've never happened before. We have nothing to uh, nothing to base this on, nothing to build on." Yes, there are plenty of plenty of historical examples that that I think a lot of lessons can be drawn from. And I mean, for me, the the question of looking at Animal Farm when I was I remember God, I don't I was young when 1984 the year 1984 hit. I was what. You know, 10 or whatever I was. Um, I'll do the math later. But the, uh, I remember on TV, everybody was, all these, all these official intellectuals were on TV saying, well, you know, let's look back at Orwell's novel about 1984 and see what we can learn from it. And these, these very well-versed intellectuals all said, well, the point of 1984 is that, is that so the Soviet Union's evil, and it will crumble, and, and, <laughs> and our system is wonderful, and, and, and we're, we're all doing things right. These, these supposed intellectuals who were unaware that Orwell was a communist, who were unaware that he spent his whole life advocating revolution. He was extremely cynical about how that revolution could really work, though, for a lot of different reasons. I mean, he was a, I mean, he's an interesting individual. He was a part of the, the, the Spanish Civil War, and he was I mean, talking about an international movement where they had, they had uh, international contingents from all over the world coming to Spain to fight against the fascists. And um, he was totally devastated by how the, the Stalinists um, and the, the Communist Party that had, at that time had been taken over by the Stalinists uh, completely devastated that movement by basically saying that anyone who didn't want to do what they thought was the best way to fight the struggle uh, had to go. And so ended up turning all the revolutionaries against each other. Revolutions were, revolutionaries were killing each other instead of fighting the fascists. Uh, he was so decimated by that that he was really pulled back from his hope for humanity. And you read a book like Amish to Catalonia, and he's so hopeful and so excited about the future. And then you read 1984 and Animal Farm, and he's just like, it's hopeless. Everybody's stupid. What do we do? I mean, his, his, character, his character of boxer. I mean, it's easy to say the corrupt people took over the Soviet Union in the end. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. But the important question is why? You know, where did that fail? And his attitude with the character of boxer, in my opinion, is saying, well, the guy's an idiot. You know, they tried to teach him how to, how to write. He couldn't learn.